This video will be a demo walkthrough of doing data analysis for the semester project. Um, I've talked to a fair number of you now about your variables and the type of hypotheses that you have and then how that would translate into data analysis that you will need to do in order to complete the results section worksheet. Um, this will be one of two videos that I record for you uh, related to that worksheet. So first I'm going to walk you through and I'll be toggling back and forth between the document that's up on my screen right now and my SPSS file, the survey.save data file, to show you how I'm doing things. <clears throat> so in this document, which I have posted on D2L in the semester project module for you, I've kind of put together and then added you know, notes off to the side uh, to explain why I'm including these things. I've copied here the um, palette instructions for conducting Pearson correlations or Pearson product moment correlations um, because uh, my first set of hypotheses are correlational hypotheses where I predicted um, positive correlation between life satisfaction and optimism and a negative correlation between life satisfaction and perceived stress. And then I also predicted there would be a negative correlation between perceived stress and optimism. <clears throat> so here are the instructions from the Palant book for doing correlations. Many of you have correlational hypotheses um, where you want to test uh, hypotheses about the strength and direction of the relationship between quantitative variables. So you would do the same thing that I'm doing here um, with that analysis. So I'm going to open up my data file <clears throat> and show you first how I got the descriptive statistics. By convention, we usually pre present the means and standard deviations for quantitative variables that are going to be involved in a correlational analysis. Um, so to get that, if you remember back to one of our earlier palette lessons, you go to descriptive statistics, descriptives, and then you want to find the variables that you're interested in. My three quantitative variables that are going to be involved in this analysis are um, optimism, life satisfaction, and perceived stress. So I hold my control key down and I click on each of those. They turn gray and I move them over. Whoops, ID doesn't belong there. I will put that back. Um, then if I click on options, I just want to make sure that the default is still selected, the mean, standard deviation, minimum, and maximum, because those can give me some information about those variables. Now the only things I'm going to be reporting uh, just by convention are the mean and standard deviation. So I go ahead and click OK, and that gives me um, the N. So it gives me the total, uh, and it gives me the um, n for each of the variables, the, the total n for each of the variables. It gives me the minimum and maximum values, it gives me the mean and the standard deviation for each of the, of the quantitative variables. Now the next step for my correlational hypotheses is to run the Pearson correlations. <clears throat> now, if you remember back to your Palant lesson on correlations, we are going to go to correlate bivariate. Um, again, we need to find the variables that we want in the analysis. And I'm going to select life satisfaction first, then optimism, then perceived stress. I want the Pearson correlation. I do not need the Spearman. I'm not doing the non-parametric option here. I want it to be two-tailed. I want to flag the significant correlations. Um, now I could have, instead of running descriptives, I could have asked it for the means and standard deviations through this program. I'm going to click that just so that you see what it looks like. <clears throat> And then I also need to make sure that the missing values uh, box for excluding cases pairwise is checked. 
click continue and hit OK. So what you're given here, um, again, it's giving me the means and standard deviations for these numbers. Notice that they're the same numbers that you got above. Um, in the correlation matrix that you're presented, notice that you're given the ones across the diagonal. That reflects the correlation of total life satisfaction score with itself. It better be uh, a, a perfect correlation or the universe doesn't work right. So that's your diagonal. On the top and the bottom, they are identical numbers. So notice you have negative 494 here in the bottom corner, same as in the top corner, uh, 483, 483, and so on. When we, when I toggle back to the other, to my worksheet demo, <clears throat> uh, what I'll be showing you is you're only going to report some of this information. Some of it is written about in the text of your results section. Some is presented in a table. What you will never, never, ever do, because it's not appropriate, you will not right click on these and copy them. You will not save them as an image and copy them and put them in your paper because that is not appropriate. All right. Um, in the, the data analysis demo that I uploaded for you, I want to note a couple of things. Um, this is a, a shot, a screenshot of the output on SPSS that you just saw for the means and standard deviations for the three quantitative variables in the analysis and also their corresponding n, which means the number of individuals who had valid uh, scale scores for those scales. Then um, what I provided for you here is what do you interpret? All of these are what's called bivariate uh, Pearson product moment correlations. They are all significant at the 0.01 level, meaning there's um, a 1% one, a 1 chance that I'm rejecting the null hypothesis by accident. <clears throat> Excuse me. The correlation between life satisfaction and optimism, that's a significant positive correlation. The correlation between life satisfaction and perceived stress is a significant negative correlation. Um, and the correlation between optimism and perceived stress is also a significant negative correlation. Now, how do you interpret those? Is that a super strong correlation? Is it a weak correlation? Um, is it a medium-sized correlation? Well, Palant gives you some guidelines. They, they're on page 140 in your text. Um, from 0.3, an R value of 0.3 to 0.49 is considered medium. So if I look at my values, they're in the 48, 49, 467 range. So these would all be described as medium level or moderate correlations. <clears throat> now, Palette also gives you a sample on page 142 of how you might want to write up a correlation result. Um, now, presenting the, the R statement, that's what this thing is right here, an R statement, you have a choice. You can either put the R result in the text of a paragraph that you write, such as this one, or you put those values in a table. You don't do both. Um, so you're, I'm giving you choices. So does Palant. This is an example from your Palant text of how to build a table. Um, there, there are, I wish authors wouldn't do this, <laughs> but they do sometimes. The, the formatting is appropriate with, with one exception. You do in the words table and the number, the word table and the number one are bold. The title is in title case, meaning the, the words with the exception of, um, prepositions, articles, and, uh, conjunctions are capitalized and they're italicized. Within the body of the table, you do not put anything in bold print. Um, APA style tables are relentlessly boring. Um, you don't, there's no flourish, there's no fun, there's no color, there's no shading. You, this, these should not be in bold. That's probably something that the publisher did. 
uh, but we do not do that in, in our actual manuscripts. Note here that instead of the ones that are in the SPSS output on the correlation table, APA style asks that you use dashes instead because the, the ones are not interpreted. Um, so you don't want to, your reader to be distracted by them. Also notice that in APA style, we round to two decimal points when we present the correlations, both in text uh, R statements and in tabular representations. The two asterisk marks that represents um, significance at uh, the, the 001 level in this case. And basically the rule is, and let me go back up to my correlation matrix, notice that the significance is reported here as 0 .000. <clears throat> when that is the case, meaning instead of 0 0.02 or 0 0.001, um, they're zero. That means that that uh, p-value, it, it goes out beyond those zeros and it becomes functionally meaningless after that. So what, do the, what does APA style ask you to do? In start, instead of point, reporting the actual value, P equals 0 0.000, instead you report that it's less than 0 0.001. In parentheses, you put two-tailed. Now in some cases, authors will write out the word two, others will use the numeral two. Both are appropriate. So if you have in your correlation table the p-value of 0 0.000, what you put in your table and in your text representation would be p less than 0 0.001. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to shift to my between groups comparisons. So any of you who are using a, a, a categorical variable where you have three or more categories. So if you're using age in three groups like I am, or you're using age in five groups, or you're using major source of stress, or relationship status, um, all of those, or sex, which is male, female, um, in this particular data set, those are all categorical da data. Now if you have grouping variables that are more, three or more groups, sex would not be one of those, but the others would be. Um, if you're using that, then you need to do a between groups ca comparison in the form of a one-way analysis of variance. Um, in, in particular, you're doing a one-way between groups analysis of variance with post hoc tests because you want to, if you get a significant F-test result, you want to compare pairs of means to see where those differences lie. <clears throat> now if I want to get the descriptive statistics that are um, relevant because I asked you in the worksheet to provide, and this isn't always required in journals, but just for educational purposes, I've asked you to provide for your categorical variables the frequency, in other words n, and the percent uh, making up the population. I'm going to toggle back now to my SBSS file and just remind you how to get that information. So you go to Analyze, Descriptives, and instead of descriptives, this time we're going to go with frequencies. So I need to find my variable, my grouping variable, and I chose on worksheet one, age in three groups. <clears throat> And I just want, I don't want these other statistics, just to remind you, this is a categorical variable. Um, I just want the frequencies and percentages. So I click OK, and what you're given here, these are my three age groups, and it gives me um, 18 to 29, 30 to 44, and 45 plus. You have the total N for the full sample, and then the breakdowns, uh, the N in each group, and the percentage in e each group. Those are the only pieces of information I'm asking you to report. All right, 
The next step, and these are the instructions right here from your palette textbook <clears throat> from page 264, which you will be working with in your palette homework this week uh, as well, so that'll be fresh in your mind. Um, these are the instructions for the between groups uh, one way ANOVA with post hoc tests, um, where you, you select analyze, you select compare means, and you, then you select the one way ANOVA. You put your dependent variables in a dependent list, your grouping variable in the factor spot, um, and then you select a variety of pieces of information that you need in order to correctly interpret the data. Um, ask it to include exclude cases analysis by analysis. Select your post talk as two key, um, and then go from there. So I'll toggle back to my data set. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice this week. Um, lots of allergies. So I've gone to compare means and down to one way ANOVA. In my dependent list, I want my three quantitative variables. So I want optimism, and I'm holding down my control key, life satisfaction and perceived stress. Put them in the dependent list. Then I need to go down to my grouping variable, which is age in three groups. And I go to post hoc, I select two key, go to options, I select descriptive, homogeneity variance, Brown, Forsyth, and Welch. And it already says <clears throat> exclude cases analysis by analysis. And I hit continue. I also wanted to estimate my effect sizes, so I select that box, and I click OK. Now this looks very busy and complicated. Um, I've given you extensive comments on my um, the handout that I've uploaded, but I'll give you the, the highlights at the moment. Um, what it, this box tells you, what this chart tells you is among the three groups, is there a significant difference? It doesn't tell you which groups are different, just within those groups, is there a difference? And the only significant test result that I have is for total optimism. So I've got um, a p-value, which is the SIG column um, of 0 0.01. <clears throat> and uh, if I look down here, that's a very small effect size. Um, then, I, since I have a significant test result on the F test, I look at the total optimism results and ask myself which groups are actually different by pairs. And what I see is the only significant difference, where you have this 0 .007, is between the youngest group and the oldest group of participants. Now I'm going to toggle back <clears throat> and walk you through the interpretation more carefully. Um, this table includes the descriptive statistics for each of the three variables. Now with my, what I recommend if, for presentation purposes is that you um, present this information and the only part of it that you need is the N, the mean, and the standard deviation for these variables. Now typically what you see in journals is that they don't give you the total N. Some people do. Um, I tend to find it a little too busy. I just focus on the group N for each of the three groups, the mean for each of the three groups, the standard deviation um, for each of my variables. And I'll show you in a minute here the, the way I would set that up. <clears throat> Now here, um, we, before we can really interpret our F-test results, we have to find out whether or not our variables, the distributions of our variables, violate the assumption of homogeneity of variance. Um, and so you're looking at the significance value here. Um, none of the significance values is under 0.05, so the assumption of homogeneity of variance has not been violated. Now I go to my um, ANOVA table and 
one of the tests, as I mentioned before, is significant. So that means there are significant between groups differences based on age in optimism, but not for life satisfaction or for perceived stress, which has relevance for my hypotheses in that domain. Um, for effect size, and you know, interpreting the SPSS table here for effect sizes is confusing. And I am basing my interpretation here on um, reading from a, a couple of articles that I found um, for, from other professors who teach courses like this of how to interpret this result. So essentially you've got an eta squared of 0 0.202. You don't interpret life satisfaction or perceived stress because you don't have a significant F test result for those. What this shows is a very small effect size. And you know, why do we interpret effect size at all? Yeah, you've got a significant result. And boy, if you look at the, the means, means plots, it looks like this dramatic, huge difference. It's really not. It, it's a fairly modest um, difference between even the largest gap uh, between the youngest participants and the oldest. Um, it explains about 2% of the variability, in other words. So if you're talking about understanding optimism, age, while it matters a little, doesn't matter a lot. Other things are likely to have more of an impact. Now, it apparently gives you this table in an earlier section of the book on interpreting eta squared. Um, and what she says is that a small effect would be 1%. Like we had 2% on the optimism um, results. And a medium effect would be 6%. A large effect would be something like 13 or 14% of the variability. So again, the effect size for um, age differences across three groups in optimism was quite small. Now, we need to look at, we don't need to look at the robust uh, test of equality of means because we did not violate the assumption of equality of variances. If we had, we would need to look at this table and interpret it. Um, here, these are the post hoc tests. So remember when I selected Tukey? So this is a Tukey HSD post hoc test. And you can see what it does. You have um, with each variable, and you only look, you don't look at anything else in this table except for the variables where you had a significant F test or an ANOVA result. So I wanted to look at 18 to 29, 30 to 34, 45 plus, and then you make paired comparisons. So the only place you've got a significant result with a Tukey uh, HSD test is between the youngest group and the oldest group. Now there is some duplication in this table because the same result right here is when you compare the oldest group with the youngest group instead of the youngest group with the oldest group. It's the same test. So you only report it once, you only pay attention to it once. So what we find here is that the difference is between the youngest and the oldest. The middle group is not significantly different from either of the other two groups. So while you, if you look at the means plot for this, it appears to be a steady increase um, in optimism with age. Um, the increments from the youngest to the middle and from the middle to the oldest there are not significant gains, but if you compare the youngest with the oldest, that is a significant increase. Now, Palant gives you some sample write-ups, and remember, I'm going to say this a lot, um, you do not, you either, you have to make a choice, you either present the numbers in the text in a paragraph, or you put the numbers in a table. You don't do both. So this is an example of presenting the data, the actual numbers, in a table that Palant provides you. Notice that she talks about a one-way between groups analysis of variance to use to explore age um, and uh, optimism as measured by the life orientation test. 
Um, if I do a good enough job of explaining the measures in my method section, I don't feel compelled to repeat that. You'll see when I do my second video for this assignment, you'll see that I don't include that, but you can if you want to. Um, I do define the three age groups, um, or Pellant defines the three age groups. You can include there, that's where you would include what I was asking you for, which was the N and the percentage. Um, and then describes um, the significance test result for this particular variable. Now this is an F statement. If you were writing up the results in paragraph form and not doing a table that includes the F values, because you, know, you can build your table the way you want to, um, I typically don't, unless I have a lot of F and over results, like five or more, I typically don't put the F values in a table, but that's just a personal preference. You can build a table exactly like this um, with the age groups, the means and standard deviations and ends, the uh, degrees of freedom information, the F, the P, and the eta squared. Um, and you can put that in there um, if you want to. And if that's the case, you don't, any of these numbers here, the F statement, um, the eta squared number, the means, the standard deviations would not be in your paragraph, but all of the verbal description would be present. So you have to choose um, which way you want to go. Um, I would like to see you practice building tables so that I know when you end up in senior research that you know how to do it. I also want, and I've been asking you to do this in your Palin homework, you to show me that you know how to properly format an F statement and a T statement and an R statement. Um, a formatting reminder, again, I wish publishers wouldn't do this. Um, ignore the use of the extra bold print here. The only thing that you put in bold in an APA style table is the word table and the number of the table. The title would be in italics, but not bold. This top um, level on the table would not be in bold. So do not use bold in the body of your tables. All right, now I did not choose variables where I would need to compare two groups, but many of you did. So if you, for instance, wanted to do uh, comparisons based on um, sex, which in this data set is only male versus female, um, I wanted to include in the tutorial some instructions for how to do that. So I'm going to toggle back to my data set um, in, in a second here. These are the instructions for the t-test for an independent samples t-test. It's independent because you are, uh, you have two discrete groups. Um, there's no overlap between the groups. So it's an independent samples t-test. What the instructions ask you to do um, in your palette text, you go to analyze, you go to compare means, and you select the independent samples t-test. Um, you select your variables, you label your uh, grouping variable, um, and then uh, you run your test. So let me toggle back over to my data set, compare means, independent samples t-test. My grouping variable is sex. I'm going to define the groups. They were coded in my data set as one and two. Then I want my test variables. I want optimism. I hold my control key down. Life satisfaction and perceived stress, for example. Um, you don't need uh, a lot of other information here. You know, this, this includes confidence intervals. That default is fine. Um, and we've asked uh, SPSS to estimate the, the effect sizes. So this is what you're given once you click OK on that result. And um, I'm going to toggle back here to my worksheet or my, um, my handout for you uh, to help you figure out 
how to interpret this output. All right, now this table is very busy. There's a lot of information in it. The first part that we have to look at is this section called Levine's Test for Equality of Variances because that determines which of these options, equal variance is assumed, equal variance is not assumed, you will look at in terms of your significance value. So if Levine's test for equality of variance is above 0.05, you use the equal variances assumed row. If it's not above 0.05, you use the equal variances not assumed row. So for this, for optimism, the significance value for Levine's test is not above 0.05. So I need to use the equal variances not assumed significance test value. So it, it really wouldn't have mattered which one I used. They're both uh, non-significant. <clears throat> so there's no sex differences there. The other two are above 0.05, so we've not violated that assumption. We use the equal variance as assumed row. Um, and here you have a significance value of 0 0.06 and for total perceived stress of 0 0.004. So differences in life satisfaction, non-significant. Differences in optimism, non-significant. Perceived stress, however, that's a significant difference in means. Now, before you go any further, you can take a peek back at your, your means, because these are the two means that you've been comparing. And what you see is that females are reporting um, a somewhat higher mean than males. And the t-test shows a significant difference. Now, you have to ask yourself, how meaningful is that difference? And that's where effect size comes into play. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Palette, and I found this confusing in your textbook, um, Palette states that effect size isn't calculated for you. Um, I believe what she's referring to is the partial eta squared. Um, and there are, there are these effect size calculators out on the web. They are quirky, and I found that different calculators produce different results. I'd rather just stick with SPSS. Um, Cohen's D is provided for you, so I think you can rely on that. Um, the mean for females is higher than that for, for males, but we need to interpret the size of the effect. Um, now, I, I showed you that little table earlier. Let me see if I can get to it quickly here. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling more. Uh, there. With Cohen's D, small is 0.2, medium is 0.5, and large is 0.8. So we go back down, back down to our effect size table. And what you see is a negative 0.282. So we're looking at, again, a small effect size. Um, uh, you know, small edging on moderate, basically, um, with the, the mean for females being slightly higher than that for males. So the sign, and I looked this up and I've copied and pasted this from the website address that I provide you here in the handout. Um, basically, the sign of Cohen's D depends on which of your means, the, the higher one or the lower one, you labeled as one versus two. So males were labeled as one, females were labeled as two. The higher value is the the females, the twos. So you end up with this uh, negative value. If they were reversed, if you had females were one and males were two, it would be the same number, but no negative sign. All right. <laughs> now this is a sample write-up of an independent samples t-test result. Again, this sample is assuming you are not building a table. So um, she's written up here statements that include the means and the standard deviations for the two groups being compared, and she reports the, the t-test statement. So you've got the lowercase t, it's italicized, you have the n, 
you have the t-value, the p-value, and you state that it's a two-tailed test. Um, and that is, by convention, what we typically do. Some journals don't require that you, you put two-tailed, uh, but they are increasingly asking that authors do so. Um, the size of, the, when, when she writes here, the magnitude of the difference in means, she is reporting the confidence intervals and the eta squared. SPSS does provide you with the Cohen's D, so um, you can write it up including that information instead. Now she also provides you with an example of a table. Um, as I've said now twice before, um, the only thing that should be in bold text is the word table and the number of the table. The title should not be in bold. It should be italicized and in title case. This whole first set of lines should not be in bold. They should be in regular type. And this line at the bottom should not be in bold. Um, this is one version of how to format a table where you have your two groups. You report the, the n, the mean, and the standard deviation for each of your two groups. You report the mean difference value. Um, if you're using partial eta squared and you want to communicate to your, your reader about the confidence intervals, you can provide that data because it's provided to you in the SPSS output. You provide the degrees of freedom, the t value, and the p value. In this case, the partial eta squared all in the table. Now, you don't always have to do that. That's your choice as a writer. You can either put all of the information in the text. If you have a small number of variables, it's perfectly appropriate to do that. If you have a lot of variables, tables are far more efficient and easier for your reader to digest. Um, I often uh, format my tables to include just the means and standard deviations. The remainder I describe in my text description um, of the findings. So there, there are a number of different ways you can do it. All right, now I need to um, switch yet again to a different worksheet. This is my demo of worksheet uh, six for the results section. Now I, I realized when I sat down to do the demo, I broke it up into two parts and left you blank spaces in between. I think it makes much more sense to just, uh, I should have labeled these as steps, like step one, you, you need for, for each of your areas of analysis, you need to report the, the descriptive uh, the descriptive statistics that are appropriate for your test. Um, and then you have to report the hypothesis testing. Now, you'll find that different authors and different journals will have different preferences for the order here. I tend to prefer to put the descriptives first, then report the significance test results. Dr. Nepp, for instance, prefers the reverse. He prefers to put significance test results first, then the descriptive information. Um, neither is wrong. Um, they're both just different ways. I don't care which you put first as long as you do both. Um, and again, remember, you have choices to make. Um, you can either present the numbers, the, the, the uh, descriptive data, the means and standard deviations, and the N, in the text and formatted appropriately. So if we look at this sample paragraph here, and I put off to the side, remember, in all caps, remember, that's shouting, um, you only present the numbers once. If you write out the descriptive, as I've done here, um, I, I, this is how I do it, and that's it's in appropriate APA style. Um, since I only have three means to, to report, I would probably just go ahead and present it in the text because it's easy to do. Um, if I have more than that, I would put it in the table. Um, it's your choice, which you want to do. You just don't duplicate. Um, I have given you uh, an example of the table. I'll show it to you in a second here. If I use a table instead, I still have to give an in-text description of what I see in the table. So I could say something like the descriptive statistics for the three dependent variables are presented in table one. 
For all three variables, the means represent moderate levels. Now, how do I know that they're moderate? Well, I know that because I know what the lowest possible score is, and I know what the highest possible score is. The means for these three variables are in the middle. Um, in one case, they're a little higher. So when I say uh, moderately high level of optimism, um, moderate stress, moderate level of well-being, I'm basing that on the fact that you have scores that on average in this sample are in the middle between the, the highest possible and the lowest possible scores. Um, so I have made you a table with the data below. I've labeled it table one and I'll, I'm going to go over those in a little bit. Um, but do note that I've, I've presented each table separately. Each table has its own dedicated page. Um, and because that is how it's done in APA style. Tables go after the references. Each table is on its own page. Now, if I wanted to write up the Pearson product moment correlations um, using a table, using a correlation matrix table, and I would highly recommend that you do a correlation matrix table, um, although you do not have to. Um, this first paragraph is only the, um, the descriptives. This paragraph is for the correlation results. So here's a paragraph that I wrote. Pearson product moment correlations were calculated to describe the relationships. Notice that I don't say anything like effect of, because that's inappropriate for, for a correlation. Um, I want to describe the relationships between the three dependent variables. The results are presented in table two. And table two, just to tell you what it is, is a correlation matrix. There was a moderate significant positive correlation between life satisfaction and optimism, indicating that as optimism rises, so does life satisfaction. There were significant moderate negative correlations between perceived stress and both life satisfaction and optimism. As perceived stress rose, life satisfaction and optimism declined. Now, I note off here to the side that this paragraph is how I write up correlation results when I use a correlation matrix table. You may choose to avoid using a table. If you do, you need to present the R results um, following the example that is provided for you in Palant. So this is an R statement. So I could write, there was a moderate significant positive correlation between life satisfaction and optimism, comma, R, the R is italicized, there's a space, an equal sign, another space, 0.48, remember the R value is rounded up to two digits, a comma, a space, an italicized lowercase n, a space, equal sign, space, are you getting the theme here? 435 is the n, comma, P, the P is italicized, and then there's a space and a less than sign and 0 0.001 followed by a comma and then the rest of the sentence with high levels of life satisfaction associated with high levels of optimism. So you, you, have, you have choices to make as to whether you want to do tables um, or in-text descriptions uh, with all of the statistical information and the numerals or some hybrid of the two. The goal is to be very clear about your results. Now the between groups comparisons for my um, version of the, the semester project, I my between groups variable is age divided into three groups. I need to provide the descriptive information. So I have what, how were the three groups divided? 18 to 29, 30 to 44, and 45 plus. I wanted to investigate age-related differences in the three dependent variables. The youngest group, and I provide the N of 149, notice N is italicized, there's a space, there's an equal sign, there's a space, and the 149 represented 33.9% of the sample. The middle age group, I provide the N again, made up 34.9% of the sample. The oldest group, 
um, n equals 137 was 31.2% of the sample. The descriptive statistics for the analysis are presented in Table 3. That's where the means and standard deviations are. A one-way between groups analysis of variance revealed a significant mean difference between the groups for optimism. And this is the F statement in total. Um, here you have a capital italicized F, a space. In parentheses, you have the degrees of freedom, 2, 432, close parentheses, space, equal sign, space, 4.64, comma, space, italicized lowercase p, space, equal sign, space, 0 0.01. Um, and here I'm not doing the less than because I didn't have a p-value that was 0 0.000. I give the exact p-value, so it's an equal sign. Comma with a small effect size, and then I provide the eta squared value. Um, and I've seen this written in a number of different ways. Some people have written eta and italicized it as I have. Others write it out and write partial eta squared as your author, Pallant has. Both are correct. A Tukey post hoc analysis revealed a significant mean difference between the youngest group and the oldest group. And I provide the p-value in parentheses. Um, the middle age group did not differ significantly from the other two groups. The one-way analysis, the one-way between groups analysis of variance tests for both life satisfaction and perceived stress were non-significant, suggesting no aid effect for age for these variables. While those in the middle group scored slightly higher than the other two groups in life satisfaction, the mean differences were not significant. Similarly, while there was a trend for perceived stress to decline with age, the mean differences were not significant. Now, if you get from me um, a comment on your paper that says you need to describe the pattern of data in the means. That's what I did here in these last three sentences. I described the pattern in the means. So higher than the other two groups. Um, the a trend to for perceived stress to decline with age. I'm giving a verbal description of the pattern in the means. It helps to look at the tables to see that. So um, here are my tables that I've developed. Um, notice here that you have the only thing that is in bold print is the word table and the number one. The title is italicized and in um, title case. You have your column labels uh, bordered by a top border and a bottom border only. Now. Um, if I were in Word, and I'm going to do a separate demo to show how to do this in Word, um, you would note I used a built a table. I didn't use spacebar because it's just inefficient and totally annoying to do it that way. Um, there are hidden lines uh, behind this, um, but I've provided the n, provided the mean, provided the standard deviation. Note that n, m, and SD are italicized. The N is lowercase because you are, actually, I think that should probably be uppercase. I'm going to have to fact check myself on that because I think that is an error. I believe this should be an uppercase N. I will, I will look at that. It's the whole sample. It should be a lowercase N if it was a subset of the sample. I apologize for that error. That should be a uppercase N. Um, M and SD are uppercase um, by convention. All right, my table two is the correlation matrix. Um, I have my three quantitative variables. Now, one way of doing this, there are other ways of doing it, but I find this the most aesthetically easy to read. Um, the word table, the number two are in bold. The title is double spaced and in title case. The column headings are across the top and they are bordered by a top border and a bottom border only. Um, typically what 
writers do is they have the name of the variable or the scale in this case numbered and in the left hand column so you have life satisfaction optimism and perceived stress they're numbered so that you can do this one is life satisfaction two is optimism three is perceived stress now remember how the SPSS printout had numbers up here you don't want to confuse your, your reader. You just want to present the numbers once. By convention, we tend to only put the bottom triangle. So you're, you're presenting the optimism correlation with life satisfaction, perceived stress with life satisfaction, perceived stress with optimism. The other thing to note here I've indicated that two asterisks means that the P is less than 0 0.001. I've put in parentheses this is a two-tailed test because that's what I ran. Now my next table, um, and remember tables go on each on their own page. Um, they are, if we were doing a full document, it would be after the references page. Um, the title is in italics, it's in title case, and it's double spaced. The word table, the number three are in bold, nothing else is in bold. Um, I built this uh, means, this is a descriptive statistics table with just the N mean and standard deviation for each group. And here I'm right, it should be a lowercase n, unlike my mistake earlier, um, because they are subsets of the full sample. And I'm providing the column header for the age group, youngest, middle, oldest, and the end mean and standard deviation for each of those. Now, my temptation is sincerely to put uh, vertical lines between the groups. APA style says don't do that. It's too much noise. I, I don't know that I agree that this is clearer. Um, I also am tempted to put horizontal lines between the variables. Um, but again, APA style recommends that you not do that. I don't know whether that's for typesetting convenience or what, but they tend to uh, recommend that you not do that. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, you can add columns to this table that represent your F-test results if you want to. I tend not to if I'm dealing with a manageable number of variables. I tend to put the significance test results directly in my paragraph instead and leave the focus of the table on the means um, themselves for my reader. Now, another way you could format this, you could put your age uh, in the rows and your variables in the columns. It's more conventional though to put the grouping variable atop, across the top and the dependent variables across the uh, on the vertical. Um, I've seen it done both ways, but the APA manual suggests that you do it this way, that you have the grouping variable across the top on the horizontal and your dependent variables on the vertical. Okay, so that concludes my um, walkthrough of the results section worksheet and also a walkthrough of doing the data analysis for that most of you will be completing, including correlations, um, analysis of variance, and independent samples t-tests.